Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Harassis Extraordinary Meeting Session on the power of the media and influencers. During lockdown, many of us have had our faces glued to the screens in our computers, tablets, cell phones, and among the personalities providing us some distraction during isolation are influencers. Those people who've built a reputation for their perceived expertise on an issue or for their lifestyles that we emulate. But increasingly, these people are holding more and more influence over ourselves as well as our children and brands, political parties, and even bad actors are starting to take note. And some tough questions have arise. How can we assure ourselves that the information purveyed by influencers is truthful and not harmful? Who do we hold accountable for the information they distribute? Is it the platforms that they post on, the advertising companies that pay them, or even government regulators? We've gathered a great group of minds to debate this issue today, and we're lucky enough to have panelists from all corners of the globe to weigh in on how influencers are affecting their local communities. I'll start off with a brief introduction of each panelist, and then we'll jump into a more fluid discussion about the power of media and influencers. So uh, to start off, Andrew Chow is the founder of Asia Future TV, He's also a certified speaking professional, a best-selling author, and has been an entrepreneur for nearly 30 years. With this meeting, he's now addressed over 100,000 people in the last 10 years alone. Maxim Jago is a futurist, a filmmaker, and author who consults and speaks on future and emerging technological development, education, and creativity. He presents an optimistic, realist look, outlook for both global development and local leadership in an increasingly connected world. Peta Milan is the founder of Transcendent Media Capital, a venture studio focusing on system-wide social and environmental for-profit projects. She's also the co-founder of Jade Eli Technologies, an Associate Fellow of the World Academy of Arts and Science, an International Advisory Board Member of the World Sustainable Development Forum. She's also part of a UN Advisory Working Group on Transforming Global Leadership in the 21st Century, and she holds numerous other roles, including that of a mother of two teenage boys. Arif Suritomo is News Director and Editor of Chief uh, um, excuse me, rather, news director and editor-in-chief of Metro TV, one of Indonesia's largest news networks. Over his two-decade-long career in journalism, Mr. Suritomo has held numerous reporter and editor roles at leading outlets including the Jakarta Post, SCTV, Sindo TV, and he's also served as a member of the Indonesian Parliament from 2014 to 2018. Megan Janetsky is a freelance journalist in Colombia covering migration, conflict, and women's rights across Latin America. Her work has been published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, BBC, USA Today, Al Jazeera, and many more. Finally, my name is Jim Glade and I'll be your moderator. I'm a principal at Pub Publicize, which is a communications firm for growth stage companies. I'm also a media advisor here at the Harassis Conference and a principal at Espacio, a digital media company. I'm a former journalist as well, having worked as an editor at examiner.com in the United States, as well as Columbia Reports here in Medellin, Colombia. And I've also contributed to publications like The Atlantic, Rolling Stone, TechCrunch, and many others. So thank you all for joining us today. And I'd like to begin our conversation about media and influencers. I, I want to start it off, given that we have a wide range of um, ages on the panel, as well as kind of geographic distance between us all. And I'd like to ask each of you for a brief statement about how you've interacted with media and influencers. Um, and 
uh, you know, for example, this could be whether or not you follow them or maybe you have a company that's paid to use them um, or maybe your children do as well. So um, maybe if we could start off uh, PEDA, if you can give me a little bit of information about how you've interacted or you, um, I know you have kids, how they interact. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, it's it's quite a, uh, so I have worked with some influencers across different countries. Um, I do quite a bit of work also for the European Commission when we're working on impact content for uh, victims of crime or different types of issues like this where we're wanting to reach people. So we have used influencers in local countries. But definitely uh, having uh, teenage kids and seeing uh, what's coming out um I think, you know, core to the issue and something that I focus on is really how do we teach news media literacy? You know, because in the in the opening statements around, you know, whose responsibility is it to see uh, what types of uh, content is coming out and how fact-based is it really? I think that there is an obligation that we have to communities to give them tools and methodologies, and this is where the intersection of media and technology is really important, where people can actually tool themselves to be able to test and and see what is fact-based and what is not, Um, because otherwise you're trying to centralise the control, which may need to happen in part two. Uh, One thing that we've seen across countries is there's not a standard of ethics um, for reporting that's actually... um, uh, monitored and uh, affected, and actually, uh, Andrew, um, um, not Andrew, sorry, um, Max might know about this because it was uh, produced out of the University of Oxford. Uh, they did a report recently which looked at um, the various stages of influence on media by government. How uh, influential is is media on government too, not just influencers themselves? And there were different metrics, um, one from all the way from collusive uh, to highly influential. And the majority of media that they found across the world is is highly influenced. So there's inherent in media bias whether it's the types of things that editors choose to accept, um, and maybe Arif can talk about this some more, and and publish based on uh, whether, I don't know how uh, personal opinions or views are affected through some editorials or whether it's the mandate of the owners and the shareholders of the publications or whether it's the relationship that the political parties have to those uh, organisations. So the influence is coming not just from traditional influences like celebrities, uh, which is also uh, very, very impactful, but also influence from other types of competing agendas. And I think that we should have a look at that because that really is shaping uh, people's views of what is the truth, uh, views on uh, the realities that they then uh, speak out for or vote for or finds its way into legislation or policy. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, we should discuss those types of topics as well um, because all of that influence, you know, culminates into a very complex, um, you know, system of information sharing that's now globalised too. I mean, right. what what you're producing in Colombia, Megan, and then it gets, you know, produced in Al Jazeera is then spread all the way over here to Portugal and to, to Singapore and, and it's now global. Um, Part of the issue, and I'll end with this point because there's a lot of points, is that we are trying to tackle a number of global issues from a still sovereign absolutism perspective, where there's sovereign laws that govern sovereign policy um, and also sovereign implications. And so when you look at the impact, say, on climate, for instance, and you have Bolsonaro deforesting the Amazon at, at record rates, but yet that property that piece of forest belongs to humanity because it impacts our our ability to live to breathe all these kinds of things who has the control who has the right to make those decisions on the behalf of humanity surely not a sovereign government government but in reality yes so when you're having something like a global issue media which spreads globally which has a global impact and it's coming out of these areas, how do you create some kind of a maybe an international legal framework or an internationally accepted benchmark for ethics that can get monitored and and support this flow of information around the planet? Um, Because that alone is the governance side is like super complex. Right. Peta, you brought up a a number of good points and I I think we're going to touch on that as well a little bit later about kind of how influencers um, cross borders 
and and how can we regulate that as well? Um, but you also had mentioned um, how does the media um, treat influencers? I think it'd be great um, to to speak to Arif, um, who's the uh, editor in chief at Metro TV, to get a, a perspective on. Yeah, thank you, Jim, and hello, everyone. Um, basically, uh, I deal more with uh, journalists uh, uh, daily for professional reasons rather than uh, dealing with uh, influencers. However, uh, the existence of those influencers, especially in Indonesia with uh, one of the most populous uh, country in the world uh, with 260 million uh, people, it's easier to create uh, influencers with millions and millions of followers with them. So um, <clears throat> um, it, it doesn't have to be a uh, celebrities or, uh, or uh, people with uh, uh, high rank officers or, um, um, or, uh, or some uh, movie stars. But uh, there are this tendency in Indonesia that there is a... Um, someone, uh, a, a very bright student in, uh, in postgraduate study, uh, studies, and he is uh, keen on uh, giving some materials in their Instagram with some uh, easy way how to deal with uh, math equations. And he has millions of followers. And um, this kind of people is very... Um, inspiring for uh, Indonesian public. B but we also face a lot of uh, situation where there are so many people who use their uh, uh, platforms or their fames and their big followers to, to create a lot of noise in, in, in society. And, and they tend to uh, uh, create a very bad distraction on how we achieve uh, common goals as a nation. So uh, that is the thing when we have to uh, uh, intervene, uh, to do some I intervention through our editorials. Those people uh, have to be um, uh, covered by um, my media uh, and we have to put their uh, situation, we have to criticize them through our editorials so the people can uh, understand about how severe is their action through their uh, social media platform and how their influence is uh, quite um, bad for the uh, uh, our common goal as a nation. So uh, that is the kind of thing that especially uh, me in, in, in Indonesia is uh, uh, dealing with or interacting with uh, influencers. So uh, however, we, we, we also uh, uh, aware that there are so many um, influencers who are doing a very good contribution to the society. Uh, some of the best influencers in, in, in Indonesia are uh, entertainers. They entertain and sometimes they use their platform to uh, uh, criticize the government uh, policies and they create a very good um, uh, discussion uh, in, in the internet. So uh, we, we we tend to support these uh, individuals. So we put them into our editorials. We, we put them as our sources. So um, there is the thing of uh, interaction, how we deal with those uh, influencers. Sometimes we criticize them, sometimes we punish them, or sometimes we support them and uh, use them as part of our editorials. Fantastic. No, thank you, Arif, for your comments. I wanted to move to Maxim. Maxim, you had mentioned that you almost wrote a book on this last night, um, but I was wondering if you could give us some. Thank you. Um, actually, just hearing the thoughts that uh, Peter and uh, Arif mentioned, uh, there was so much to unpack in, in what just two of our speakers have said. It's fascinating. I feel like we could spend days uh, exploring just those ideas. My interest in uh, the impact of influencers and the media in general is, I suppose, connected to my broader interest in uh, those aspects of the human condition that are broadly uh, universal. And I think that uh, Peter mentioned, for example, that the impact of, of this kind of media is global now. And this is a great challenge for governments because 
again, as Peter mentioned, you know, governments are tied to their sovereign borders. Their, their agendas are bound up within the soil of the region that they represent. Um, commercial enterprises are not. And our media is not. The whole the definition of the way the, the Internet works, for example, is that it's non-geographic. But I think that ultimately, when we examine the impact of any uh, influence, what we're, uh, what we're looking at is uh, volition. We're looking at uh, the ways in which people gather information and understanding and develop a sense of identity within that context and make choices about that understanding. And my definition of um, democracy, for example, is an informed public voting freely. And these are very difficult uh, things to achieve. They're very difficult things to arrive at. Uh, the most difficult part of that is the informed part, because you have to have uh, understanding. And you have to, again, you have to have a sense of identity that you place uh, within that context. One of the challenges that I think we face uh, in most parts of the world today is that there seems to be a trend in education, right from early learning, right up through to um, university level, you know, to degree level, that our capacity for reasoning and analysis is being diminished. We're learning more and more how to interpret the brief, how to understand what we're being told, but not necessarily how to have opinions about that brief. And we have this trend, for example, where uh, it's considered somehow uh, unacceptable to be offended. And uh, there is a difference between intending to cause offense and unintentionally causing offense. But that distinction isn't very uh, popular in the media because, uh, again, as a fundamental human um, quality of experience, we do seem to be evolved to focus and fixate on the negatives, the threats, the unresolved issues, much more than the things that are working fine, thank you very much. And so the media uses that against us, not as some, I don't think, some great evil conspiracy, but simply because as um, organizations intended to make profit and make money, and even the BBC now, the chart has slightly changed so that viewing figures are a factor when they're establishing whether they can justify the license fee. It's the same difference. There's this drive to have drama and uh, a focus on the negative. Uh, but as uh, Arif mentioned, there are actually some incredibly positive examples as well. And I think that those positive examples appeal to the benign fundamental experience of being human, that we want to uh, feel a connection with people. We want to feel part of a group. We want to love and be loved, and we want our love to be accepted. And I realize that might sound rather poetic in a discussion about social media influences, and we've got TikTok now as a, a powerful influence, um, where we have these memes sweeping across the uh, TikTok in days. But those are the fundamental needs that are being met by these influences. Some of the biggest YouTube stars are people who just bear their soul and are prepared to be uh, emotionally naked with the audience. And they uh, seem honest and truthful and therefore are powerfully influential. Thanks, Maxim. Actually, it'll be great to talk a little bit later about whether or not they are actually um, delivering on those, on those um, kind of qualities that we're looking for um, in relationships and, and maybe talk about the mental health of following influencers as well. Um, but before we go there, I, I wanted to um, uh, send it over to Andrew as well to get his perspective um, on, on it. Well, um, I think in Singapore and maybe in many parts of Asia, uh, there are many influencers. So it depends on what kind of influencer are you talking about? There are influencers who speak about what they are paid for, right? So they are the bloggers, the Instagrammers, the YouTubers. They are paid to say and to influence something. There are also politicians in Singapore who are great influencers, and that's very dangerous. So they speak about what they want to see in the society. They want to speak about what they want to win in the next election. Of course, there are uh, speakers like us who are also influencers. We speak about what we want to transfer the knowledge the wisdom the insights but i think a true influencer speak about what he stands for and that has to come back to the grand idea of personal branding i think the intention and the objective of influencer is very important what do you set up to do 
And I think uh, on social media, in many platforms where there are a lot of manipulation of content, feeding, syndication, they look out for this micro influencer and they are being used to feed people who are on the fence about something, maybe to influence the election, maybe to influence um, the views of pandemic. It can be used to influence many things. And I must say, I know Arif may not like to hear this, but I think the mainstream media is part of the stakeholders for this influencer. I know of many reporters who are influencers themselves, and sometimes when they're off reporting, they share their views and they always say, this is just my view. It doesn't represent the station I come from. Mm -hmm. So they have something to say as well. So my bigger question is this, when we talk about content that's not verified or even near fake news, who is the real policeman who says, what I say is fake news and what the media report is news, right? So who is going to police the mainstream media? There's no one. Really, I can tell. Right. So I think it's a kind of a love-hate relationship uh, between mainstream media and social media. Influencer. And I must say one more time, uh, actually, Arif, you may not need to hear this again, but I just want to say that the mainstream media actually benefited the most in the last 10 years for social media. Because without social media, no one reads the news. Because today, the news agency reports news differently on Facebook than on TV. The same piece of information is being presented differently for different uh, audience and different for different tastes. So I don't see influencers necessarily as bad, but I think it gives the public a balanced view of what is going on in the world. I think what we are worried about is micro influencer that has a very big voice. Yeah. That is very dangerous than a mega influencer who has a small voice. So you rather have someone who has a small voice rather than then someone has a big voice and they influence a lot of people. So I know a lot of minority diversified groups, they have very strong voice. They can influence people to a demonstration in Singapore, which is very rare. We, you know, we are such a law abiding country, all right? But this can happen in Singapore. So we can imagine that um, it is really region and uh, culture centric for influencers uh, in Asia. China, an influencer, a blogger can sell a million cars in 37 seconds with transaction all paid up, 37 seconds by Alibaba. So you can imagine that kind of commercial value, it's hard to ignore when it comes to brand association. And, and so, Andrew, and, yeah. Andrew you, made, um, you made a statement um, that uh, potentially the mainstream media could be one of the biggest uh, beneficiaries of social media. Also, the argument could be made that um, you know a lot of their revenue was drained um, from from social media. I, I'm wondering, since we are lucky enough to have um, a couple of journalists on, um, hmm. and 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 you actually made a really good point too, Andrew, is that um, now, for example, Megan is a freelance journalist. Um, I, I know you're super active on Twitter. Um, I know because uh, I follow you. So, how much of that now? is part of your job and how much does that contribute to you getting yeah you know um it, it's it's quite tricky so first i would say i think in recent years there used to be this very black and white um realm in which journalists navigated where we didn't share any of our opinions or just were very like a personal you know like there are so many famous journalists who proudly declare that they've never voted in an election and now I think we're seeing this space start to open up and I think the key is perhaps social media and also this new um, plethora of voices or the simple fact that all of our lives are published everywhere um, all the time and I think it's really really key for journalists to learn how to navigate that and navigate that well for it for instance I think it can be really dangerous. And I think there are journalists I've seen who um, will just throw out whatever opinion they have about a topic they're covering. I, I think that that can be very dangerous, this like graying, this kind of gray area we're seeing with these lines. Like for instance, for me, Twitter is very important. I get a lot of information 
um, off of Twitter because I think there's a lot of crowdsourcing that we can do, especially in the pandemic when I can't go out and do the ground reporting I need to do. Um, at the same time, I think I'm not voicing my, like if I'm covering a, a well-known politician who sparks a lot of controversy in Colombia, I'm not going to voice my opinion about it. I don't view that as my job. I, I know other individuals do. I, I tend to be frank if, if there's a, a fact about um, something, but you know, I, I think there are plenty of people who are now much more willing to express their opinions. And I am to an extent about certain issues, usually for instance, about like um, influencers or um, the actual media. I view that as like the realm in which I have a voice. But I think that what the risk that we run as journalists is discounting our voices as I don't think anyone is an unbiased observer. We're all humans. And I think it's really important to recognize that, that humanity in journalists, especially as uh, you know, social media becomes really an integral part of our lives. At the same time, I do view it as very important as drawing lines and not not shouting out an opinion about something when you're also publishing a piece that you claim to to be unbiased, you know, or at least if you're um, ex giving an opinion, you as a journalist have a responsibility to back that up with facts and and interact online in a certain way that's that's what i view a journalist's job as and i think it's rapidly changing and we're having to grapple with a lot of these things like how much of my day-to-day -day life do i want to share on social media because um you know you are a public figure and your voice does have some value even if it's just the most minute things right right um you you made a really good point about kind of your responsibility as a journalist um and and what you share and obviously journalism has a code of ethics um social media influencer we're just breaking the surface of really what that is so i'm wondering if we can kind of talk a little bit about um and maybe we'll start with maxim um, really about wh where the responsibility lies um, um, as well in terms of self-censoring as, uh, as an influencer or educating the population about influencers and, and their role. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a huge topic. You know, that I suppose the thing about words is that they are as impactful as physically touching somebody. If I uh, say the words uh, red apple, everyone is now imagining a red apple and there's nothing that you can do about it and we don't differentiate very well between things that we imagine or remember or dream or witness and so anybody expressing an opinion is going to change your perspective because you're experiencing the opinion that they describe and it's something that came up in a conversation previously is that we're actually very poor at differentiating between something that is compelling and something that is true and so when you have these influences that express themselves in very dramatic, charismatic, powerful ways with powerful language, uh, you know, they say 90% of communication is nonverbal, even on the telephone. So you've got these people expressing themselves in exactly the right way to hit people's buttons. And that stirs up their emotions. And it's the emotions that make the decisions, not the intellect. We, we rationalize our decisions later, having made them emotionally. And I think that one of the reasons that influencers are so powerful is because they're so often driven by a kind of emotional motivation or seem to be driven by emotional motivation. But I think that, you know, in many ways, this can be a great force for good. But it brings us ultimately back to this question, uh, this difficult question, actually, that Peter uh, touched on of governance. Ultimately, we have to find ways to provide leadership, which is not the same thing as management. And leadership provides a kind of framework within which people can take the most positive action possible, we hope. Uh, somebody mentioned bad actors earlier, and 
I, I always laugh because as a filmmaker, a bad actor is a terrible thing. But you, there are also good actors in the geopolitical space. And in particular, these are people, I think, who are framing the narrative in ways that lead us to constructive, positive action that is compassionate and rooted in kindness. And one of the things that I've seen emerging from the pandemic, I, I actually think that once we get through the uh, the impact of the pandemic, much of our lives will return to the way it was before, probably 80 or 90 percent of the same. But one of the things I've seen emerging is a great deal more compassion between people, a great deal more mutual concern. And there seems to be a reduction in that, that the, the poison of cynicism that's been growing around the world. And I'm very happy to see that change happening, both in the influencers and in the media uh, and in governance in general. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm petted. So, sorry to put you on, on the spot there. P P Pettit, can you did, we, did we have a glitch? My thing just froze for a minute. <laughs> sorry. Oh, okay. I didn't hear. Did you, did you say something? Um, I was just wondering if, if you caught the, the, the end of uh, what Maxim was saying, if, if you had any thoughts I, on that I as did, well. yeah, because I've, I've had a burning question in me that I wanted to, <laughs> to ask since, uh, you know, listening to uh, Andrew speak. Um, I think quite some years ago we saw um, the development of opinion editorials even in mainstream media, even in the likes of The New Yorker and, and places like this that were considered highly reputable and highly credible sources of news. Um, and it seems that there's been this swing almost, you know, from op-ed meaning you know, uh, opinion editorial to opinion education, where there's this collapsing of opinion and fact. Um, and more and more of what we're seeing put out into the world is is based on these opinion type, uh, type views, even, um, you know, in the, in the journalism or the reporting, there's, you know, one, one thing that's very interesting is we're seeing, and, and maybe Andrew knows about this with the the future kind of aspect is we're seeing that more and more people are becoming journalists. You know, um, no offence to the uh, to the the educational requirements and the integrity of of qualified journalists, but uh, I know of a company that's doing some really interesting and exciting things where uh, local people who are kind of caught behind enemy lines in a conflict zone, uh, for instance, in Yemen or in Syria, were using their mobile phones to capture live footage and report uh, on things that other journalists weren't able to access. And then big networks like the BBC and so forth were buying that content off of uh, through a brokerage um, for those local people. Um, so more and more people are coming into their own, and it's the same in filmmaking too. You know, the iPhones now have a 4K camera. You can pick up, you can make your own short film, you can submit it into film festivals and start establishing yourself as a credible filmmaker, even with no education and training in filmmaking. Um, and I think the opening up of that space is really interesting and powerful because it does bring in this sense of connectivity and community. And I, I, I profoundly agree um, uh, with the points that Max has been making about our needs to feel connected, our needs to feel loved and validated and these types of things. And that's why some influences are so powerful because there's this interpretation of what authenticity looks like. And so if someone's sharing an opinion or, uh, or someone's sharing a point of view that taps into what this authenticity looks like, a particular move away from the... Um, from the uh, corporatized kind of patriarchal view of expert and, you know, uh, follower um, to a sharing of authentic, authentic views. People can do that authentically. They can act that powerfully. They can connect to people's needs where people feel like they're connecting with the people that they look up to and then they believe what they have to say. And I think, um, you know, Stacey Dooley, who I respect a lot as a journalist and has become quite prevalent in the BBC, kind of was a bit of a trailblazer in this sense because she was going into uh, really conflict zones with um, Al-Shabaab and uh, different kinds of areas and, and reporting on the women and getting quite emotional 
uh, uh, on camera about you know the the plight of some of these people, and then that had people trust her that humanness the the connection as a credible source of really getting into the trenches and reporting what's going on and then her career has just has has really grown and um i think and and she wasn't someone that was formally trained as a journalist she was she just had a beautiful vulnerability that uh people connected to and and she reported well and she was great in front of the camera and she's smart so um so i think that all of this is shifting now away from fact to this uh, way of like information sharing as a way to connect and how do we discern what's real and what's not real i mean that's hard in yeah. personal relationships let alone when you're talking about <laughs> news like yeah. this guy that i'm dating how do i know he's for real you know or whatever is going on like we struggle with that as human beings and now we're seeing that blended into our our, our information consumption um, I, i'm actually curious to um to to see how arif would weigh in on that um on kind of the shift um from kind of fact fact based tell it as it is news to um more of the emotion based um and maybe opinion oriented um coverage of the news well uh, uh for me uh the uh the news is well you know the news uh we have this uh, certain formula that we cannot um uh uh we cannot uh go far from that um we have this uh uh, uh some uh reg- especially in 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 my newsroom that uh there are there are uh, some rules that we have to uh implement so uh, uh especially for uh when we relate to this uh situation especially when we have to deal with influencers there are facts that we learn a lot from them uh we learn a lot from how they can be very very extremely uh honest with themselves uh sometimes we uh the media uh especially the mainstream media are often the, uh criticized by being too uh, uh statistical uh being uh, being extremely uh data driven So uh there is the thing that we learn from those uh, influencers they can be very frank about about things they can be uh, very colorful about their expressions and then uh, <clears throat> uh there is the thing that uh how we try to put uh, some some sometimes some a little bit of drama inside the news and and a little bit of uh, emotions and there is the thing that we we uh, try to connect with their existence Uh, I I guess uh it uh, answer the questions. No that that does that sounds great. Um I I had another question um I I I wanted to talk a little bit about um um the education aspect of it as well and um Peta and, and Maxim you guys had um mentioned this um a little bit about the BBC for example and and um the initiatives that they have to kind of educate the population on fake news etc I'm wondering mm-hmm. a- Andrew in 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 Singapore um do you see anything like this in the region as well or how important is education um to solving the problem of misinformation Um yes actually in Singapore we are trying to educate our younger ones since primary school to discern media and messaging. So for example you look at media whether it's a social media or mainstream media there are three factors there are content engagement and the reach. So mainstream media are high on content very low almost zero on engagement because you guys are not supposed to interact with the public that much you just do balance reporting whereas for the bloggers they may be low on content very high on engagement so the key difference i see is a degree of engagement because their followers and their tribes are equally big sometimes so the point here is we must study the art and science of engagement and teach our younger ones how to discern what is real engagement so 
I feel that um, the education system right now, we are moving there, but we're still not there because hmm. the people who teach engagement are from our part of the institution. They are teachers who are paid by the government. So they have a standard syllabus and I always feel that it's more skilled towards the mainstream media, but not so much the social media. Because social media evolved so much that in the last 15 years, it has caused a lot of complication. It has caused a lot of confusion. So, and it has caused a lot of conspiracy theory. Even my mom at 75 years old, once I taught her how to use Facebook, TikTok and everything, she started sharing a lot of fake news to her siblings, which is my aunties, uncles and, and what. So I have a teacher, look, you have to ask yourself certain question. Don't receive something and just forward it to all your friends. You got to discern. So discernment is not something that even an adult can learn. It has been taught since day one from school. So I think this is a call for all government that media and messaging has to be in the syllabus, at least in the academic world. Thanks so much. And I, I, I mean, you brought up a really good point um, as well. It, it kind of also sounds like, you know, it's it's on us a little bit uh, as citizens as well to, to educate ourselves. Um, so given the fact that we only have a, a few minutes left, I wanted to kind of end on a note <clears throat> that has to deal with that a little bit about education. Um, it would be awesome if we could just go around um, and each person can give me a very brief statement about what is one thing we can do to make the world a better, more credible place um, ourselves. And maybe we'll uh, start off with you, Maxim. Sure. I, I, it's a huge question, but I would say fundamentally we need to teach children the meaning of the word why and to teach them how to how to use that word and to keep it in mind so that they can see the causal connections between things going on around them and their own decisions that they're making because that uh, increase in self-awareness uh, makes people harder to manipulate harder to control thank you thank you thank you um megan maybe you have a uh, something to share yeah, I think um, I'll keep it fairly simple and just say it's up to everyone to be um, incredibly skeptical about the content that you read online. You know, a lot of um, this influencer content, especially, is designed to look very similar to, to media content or something. It's designed to pull people in and make people feel they can trust them or have this sort of connection, right? And I think it's up to individuals to make sure that what you're posting is factual and that you're not just resharing something that seems factual but could easily do damage. You know, you always see those those crazy photos that appear like they've come from some event that happened right. yesterday and then it actually came from like something that happened 10 right. years ago in another country and i think it's just really important because like those photos and that kind of information it gets stirred because a friend that you trust or a even a reporter or an influencer right. or x y or z individual that you trust on social media shared it and you trust them so then you share it because you view it as as mm -hmm. true when you as an individual, each individual is up to them to be skeptical of everything that they consume now. It's unfortunate, but it's true. Oh, thank you so much. Um, uh, Peta, I wonder if you could weigh in really br really briefly. We have about one minute left, so I wanna make sure there's time for everybody. Um, on, on one thing to make a world Sorry, I was more credible. Yeah, I, I think it, uh, it boils down to education of our community so that they can learn this discernment um, that we've been talking about because ultimately they're not going to sell it if we're not buying it. You know, so there is, you know, the the power really does sit with the people. Yeah. So we need to educate our communities in how to really discern what's, what's fact-based, what's truthful, what's, uh, you know, opinion and the difference. Great, thank you very much. Um, real quick, uh, uh, Arif, you wanna hop in? 
Yes, uh, real quick. Um, uh, we are now at war. Uh, we are in a various battle to win how we influence the public opinion making process. But uh, this war can end when we, uh, each party can consider the same thing, which is public interest. Every time influencers are about to launch some content in the internet, they must pass one question. Is it going to be good for public? When the answer is no, uh, they know what to do. So uh, before everyone has such the same understanding, the combination of law enforcement and education is still needed. Perfect. Thank you. Um, uh, Andrew, one last uh, one last comment, and I think you probably have a couple seconds to do it. Sure. I'm very inspired by what Maxim said, so I'm going to be on that. Eight words only. The why can be taught. The how must be caught. So you can be taught about why, but how to do it properly and add value, you have to figure it out on your own. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists today. Um, and for those that have stayed up late, woke up early, thank you very much. Um, as well as everybody that has tuned in and listened to the panel session. I hope you enjoy the rest of the Harassus Extraordinary meeting. Um, and thanks again for your time. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very Everyone. much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.